Hey folks! Boy did Unreal Engine developers shine at this year's The Game Awards, with over a dozen new UE games revealed and a total of 9 awards presented to Unreal developers, including It Takes Two for Game of the Year. Help us celebrate all the great games at the show by heading over to the Unreal Engine feed for a full recap. And in the spirit of looking back, we're thankful to have been able to accelerate the incredible work of over 1,600 teams and creators through epic mega grants, from dinosaur survival games and medical imaging tools to metaverse-ready fashion design platforms and feature films, this group of recipients are shepherding some amazing projects. Explore more about them on the feed. Wrap up your gear with brand new courses from Unreal Engine. Learn how to render movies, create sandbox style games, build audio driven designs, and develop mixed reality experiences for HoloLens 2. Ready to get started? Then dash on over to the Unreal Online Learning Portal. And if you're looking to explore blueprints with a focus on non-gaming experiences, our latest webinar demonstrates a multitude of interactive elements for just that. Visit the Unreal Engine YouTube channel to watch it now. Upcoming action adventure The Gunk is both a metaphoric examination of modern society's struggle with conservation and a chance for the development team that made a name for itself with the popular Steam World games to stretch its wings. Check out our dev interview with Image Informed Games' team to discover how The Gunk was born and then shaped by the team's previous titles. Creating the next generation of pop stars? We like the sound of that! The teams at Lulu AR and Silver Spoon Animation are proving that virtual avatars can reinvent entertainment and change the lives of rising talents thanks to their work on Fox's new singing competition, Alter Ego. Watch our spotlight to see how mocap is helping these rising stars take the stage. You wouldn't want to miss this! Quixel Megascans Trees is now in early access. The brand new asset type was designed to accelerate your photorealistic environments. Head over to the Unreal Engine Marketplace to download the first pack and read more about Megascans Trees on Quixel's blog. Autodesk has recently released their Unreal Live Link for Maya plugin, making it easier than ever to stream animation data from Maya to Unreal in real time. The plugin enables the ability to work on character assets right in Maya and see previews of your work reflected in context in Unreal. Visit their website to learn more. In our first community spotlight, take a stroll into this lovely autumn scene from Jose Luis Revelta Garcia. Visit their ArtStation page to see reference shots, materials, and more. Enjoy the latest installment in Treehouse Digital's series of Scary Tales. When a shy teen reveals a secret well to three friends, they get a terrifying reminder to always be careful what you wish for. Watch the complete short film and their brand new behind-the-scenes video on Treehouse Digital's YouTube channel. From developer Aragon Shanghai, reveal the secrets of the fantastical, hand-drawn world of Engarden in After Image. Venture through vast landscapes and ruins while meeting mysterious, colossal beings and roaming spirits in the fast-paced ARPG. Wishlist After Image on Steam. Thanks for watching this week's news and community spotlight, and it's the last one of 2021. From the Unreal Engine team, we wish you a wonderful holiday and a happy new year. Hi, and welcome to Inside Unreal, a weekly show where we learn, explore, and celebrate everything Unreal. I'm your host, Amanda, and boy, do I have a slew of incredible guests with me today. So first of all, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, so today we have Tim Sweeney, our very own CEO and founder. Thank you for joining. Um, we have Jeff, Technical Director on Special Projects. Galen, for our Senior Evangelist on Quixel and Simon, Senior Director for EOS. Thank you all so much for coming. Uh, you know, 2021 has been a, an incredible year. We've seen a lot of advancement in digital humans, a lot of next-gen dev, virtual production, animation, uh, just been really, really stellar. And so we're excited to dive in and, and talk about a lot of the uh, incredible ac accomplishments internally and externally for, for the year. So again, thank you all for joining. And, we 
you know, anything you'd like to add before we dive right in? Other than Jeff's amazing mug. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, Stop we started <laughs> started the year off uh, with a sneak peek uh, for MetaHuman Creator. So that was done in February, and then we were able to release it to the community in April. So the you know is an incredible cloud streamed app. Uh, the best part is we can see the community creating real-time digital humans in under an hour. Not, you know, this this pipeline, which used to take many, many hours, if not days, uh, is now super fast. And um, this is only possible due to the R&D efforts from Three Lateral and Cubic Motion and teaming up with those great teams. And so we hope you all have taken advantage of them. We've seen tons of community projects oftentimes in our community spotlights that have taken advantage of them. Uh, Aaron Sims Creative used them in The Eye, which was a, a short film that was premiered in Short, short Nightmares. Um, also in use for sign language by Kara Technology as interpreters for various videos and streams. Um, so that's been really, really amazing. And um, I know Jeff, you, were, you all leveraged them quite heavily in The Matrix Awakens, which we'll dig into the project specifics a little later, but could you speak to um, how the metahumans actually populated uh, the city there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, we would not have had the resources to populate the city without using the metahuman tool, honestly. Um, so, so we use it in two ways, really. The, um, the, the, the first way is, is actually just making the pedestrians in the city. You know, we, we wanted a city that was full of life and had a lot of people walking around and we leaned heavily on the MetaHuman tool to do that. So we, we took we took a lot of meshes out of the MetaHuman tool, you know, exported a bunch of heads, a bunch of the outfits, put in a couple of custom outfits and then made like a like a pieces, parts, mix and match um, a human assembler to get a lot of variety within the city. Um, so the, the MetaHuman tool was, was a godsend for that. Um, and the second part was the the main character, I don't know if you recognize the main character, but the Io, the, the, mm -hmm. the girl you play in the sandbox. Um, so she is actually played by Ada, the metahuman we released in the spring. Um, so we gave her, you know, gave her a custom hair, hairdo. Um, we had a new costume that was designed by um, the costume designer for The Matrix, actually, uh, Kim Barrett. So she gave us a great design on that, and we gave her a new outfit. But, um, but that's actually the Ada metahuman from the spring. And, and we were really excited to see how that held up against you know keanu reeves and carrie ann moss um in some of those shots and, and we were we were super excited to see that that the the quality and the fidelity of the metahumans held up super well uh you know up against actual likenesses of actual humans yeah and we've we haven't necessarily designed the tool to be like the central characters to people's projects but we have seen people use them in this way right it's it's not meant mm -hmm. to replace that it's meant to be an augment so that you can have realistic digital humans in your projects whether it's in the backgrounds or filling up scenes or anything but you know they can still very much serve as a a central part of your short films or games mm -hmm. um if you want them to and i think that that speaks to the capability and the extensibility of of that uh, as a tool um mm -hmm. and the yeah, best and part we, is we, oh, go ahead i'll say that we animated her with um just super traditional pipelines also you know the same the same stereo head mounted rigs we use for for other characters the same mocap um you know by by an actress uh, was mapped onto this artificial character and then look great when they come right out ready to you know they're rigged once you export mm -hmm. them from uh meta human creator and then it's ready to just toss your animation on then and, and run with them so it's mm -hmm. really, really awesome. Um, anybody want to add anything about MetaHuman Creator before we, we move on? Well, I just point out, it, the real aim with it, this and a lot of the other things that we're doing at Epic is to put AAA quality game development um, within reach of everybody. Uh, and you know, in just a few years ago, you had to have a multi-hundred person team um, it would cost over a hundred thousand dollars to build characters of this quality one at one at a time, right? The, the aim is to uh, to make it possible for anybody to use this quality of characters without uh, having to have any sort of budget for it at all. Um, between the libraries of you know, massive amounts of high quality Quixel digital models, um, you know, scaling up to film and television quality, scaling down to nanite and scaling down to low end Android smartphone platforms to MetaHuman for humans. Uh, Putting game development within reach of everybody is a key goal. 
Awesome. Yeah. And with that, you know, moving beyond MetaHuman Creator, we actually got to put Unreal Engine 5 in early access this year. So we announced UE5 last year, but it was super exciting to actually put it in the hands of the community this year, along with the absolutely gorgeous sample Valley of the Agent. Um, if you haven't had the chance, be sure to watch the UE5 um, Early Access Inside Unreal series. It details a number of the major features, Lumen, Nanite, World Permission, uh, Partition, sorry, uh, Metasounds, you name it, they go on. But uh, Galen, you actually worked on Valley of the Ancient. Uh, what was it like collaborating on such a, a major project? Yeah, I mean, it was a it was a truly special project to be a part of. Um, we have just such an amazing team here at Epic and being able to collaborate with so many different uh, product owners to get this off the ground was <clears throat> it was a true feat. <laughs> and it was one of the first projects that we've really ever done uh, that was actually fully remote. Um, so at least for a project that I've been attached to here. So um, we actually started uh, the, the scouting process, because we actually went and sourced all this data from Moab, uh, Utah. Um, mm -hmm. And with travel restrictions and things being a little dicey, <clears throat> we actually, uh, we, we brought, uh, it was pretty much just me and then two other guys here that were based in the States and we're not scanners. <laughs> so we actually went and sourced all of the data uh, for this and then had, you know, our amazing team on the back end go and process all the, the data um, for us in a really, really short period of time so that we could actually start production basically January, like right when we got back from our winter break. Um, and I mean, it was it was a really challenging project in a lot of different ways, right? Scope, you know, kind of went up and down and, you know, kind of did the whole you know, kind of normal thing for <laughs> projects that we do. And uh, ultimately, I think we landed on something that was really compelling, right? Like kind of tying all these different engine features together and um, being able to kind of have like an interesting narrative that tied back to, you know, the demo that we did just a year previous to that, right? And uh, Lumen in the Land of Nanite. So featuring Echo again is just really awesome. You know, she's just a really cool character. And um, it was great to kind of have her be inside of this world too. Um, and just kind of tie all these engine features together. So, and I mean, the coolest thing to me, obviously, you know, now that we're a couple months removed from the project is, it was definitely like a stealth release, right? We put it out there. We we did the the <laughs> mic drop moment where at the end it's like, oh, and by the way, you can download this today, right? Um, I think that was a really cool moment for the community. Um, and I think that uh, the coolest thing is like literally sign on to our station within like 24 to 48 hours after the release and seeing people post environments using Unreal Engine 5 early access. Like that blew my mind, which is, <laughs> I know it's something that we should have expected, but it was something that like, for me, like sign on to our station every day, like I'm a literal, like every, every day art station user to see that. I mean, it was just, it was so cool. Um, and again, we just have such a talented team here. So, uh, I think that we created something pretty special. What do you think were some of the biggest takeaways? Like, you know, having to establish that pipeline, what's, you know, having to go through that ourselves and seeing the remote setup, what do you think are the biggest takeaways for our teams and then and how that benefits the community? Yeah, I mean, I think that the thing that maybe a lot of people, maybe they realize is maybe they don't, you know, but, um, you know, these projects that we do internally here, uh, they serve so many purposes for us outside of just creating a really cool video at the end of the day, right? I think that the thing that I'm honestly the most proud of is are a lot of the intangibles associated with this project. I know I've said this a lot internally to like a lot of the team, but I think that just being able to walk away with like this mountain of Jira tickets that we just totally slashed. I think that's that's amazing, right? To be able to sort of look at how, how far the engine has come just in a short period of time. And I mean, these projects like help us step on all those rakes, which is really pretty cool, right? Like in a weird way. Um, and the amount I think that the team has learned you know, just in working on these types of projects, you know, and working in a very volatile tool base or code base rather, is just one of those things that, I mean, it takes a really special crew. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, it was, it was pretty awesome to, to have an, an, an end result like we did, so. Yeah, I, I just wanna jump in and say thank you for, for your rake stepping, because uh, uh, <laughs> I was working on the, the Matrix demo at the time and uh, and this project went first and, and ate a lot of the pain for us on this. So that was that was amazing. Huge help. Yeah, I mean, and even, you know, Reverb, or sorry, the Lumen in the Land of Nanite demo, um, you know, from a year ago, right? Like that was kind of the building blocks of like how we kind of set up like some of these other demos in mind, right? And we wanted to keep expanding the scope of those things, right? So, um, you know, the, the scale of these demos, I think, is one of those things that is 
pretty impressive as well, just in that we've created something that's much larger than I think we ever anticipated. <laughs> the first kickoff meeting, I, I, I mean, when we were talking about doing this project, I mean, it was a much smaller demo, in fact. Like, it was more of like a beautiful corner. We were looking to basically like create like this beautiful frame where it was like, we could say something marketing speak wise, it was like, hey, what you're seeing in this one frame has more triangles than like the entire island of Fortnite and all the Gears of War games combined, you know, something like that, right? And we could say that because it was true and it was accurate, right? Um, but then it was kind of expanded like, oh, why don't we do, you know, like 16 square kilometers or something like that? <laughs> and so, so we did. Scaled it up a little. <laughs> a little bit, yeah. <laughs> you know, since folks can actually download and explore the the sample project in there what do you what are some of the best um like learnings or takeaways they can get from actually getting hands-on and digging into that demo well yeah i mean i think that what the coolest thing is about like, being able to download these projects is that it really demystifies the process right like we really want to make it so that there is that open and transparent nature to these projects and that we not only create these learning materials that you can go and you know see it on our on our youtube channels and twitch and everything like that but also being able to literally peek like under the hood and see what's going on inside these projects. I mean, I think that that's really special, right? Because I can say like for me personally, sort of in growing up in this industry and like learning, one of the most important things for me was <clears throat> opening projects or samples or, you know, tutorials or whatever it was that were way more complicated or scaled up, you know, from like a level of complexity than what I was able to sort of achieve at that time. And it really was something that helped me a lot in sort of looking at projects again, where I was learning constantly by saying, well, why, why are those two nodes plugged in when I'm opening the material or what, are, what do these different things mean? Right. And so I would encourage any person who's, you know, looking to learn the engine, right. It's just to, like, don't be intimidated by these projects. I know that they're massive, right. Like, and they can be a little intimidating, <laughs> yeah. but the fact is, is like, if you go and you just take a look and see like how we did these things, I think that you'll find that it is a lot more accessible than maybe like these kind of beautiful frames that we're looking at kind of actually, uh, let on, you know, and we're releasing so many different training materials and tools that really make the lives of artists and just creators in general, just a lot easier than it was five, 10, 15 years ago. So it's an exciting time, I think, to be in the industry. Absolutely. And uh, we've been excited here just to see some, you know, big names already jump on board, you know, Ninja Theory is using Unreal Engine 5, um, which they, you know, had an outstanding gameplay reveal at the game awards if you haven't mm -hmm. seen it please go watch that it is so so stunning um the coalition plans to leverage ue5 and we're already seeing tons of great like you mentioned community projects um, we have a little sizzle we can show um that is just some of the really incredible stuff coming out of the community uh black myth wukong's an absolute standout um I think that's one of the things I'm really most looking forward to is seeing, you know, as we refine these tools and get them um, really ready to be in the hands of everyone, uh, what what we're going to see in the community and out in the wild and uh, the, the variety of projects and scenes that will uh, be, you know, coming to light that wouldn't have been possible previously or would have been very challenging to do previously. Um, I don't know. Tim, I wanted yeah, to ask I'll you. Yeah, I'll echo that. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I was just going to say that Ninja Theory trailer just blew my mind. Like, I, I was so, so impressed by that. The audio in that game, too, is so cool. Like, it's just amazing. So, can't wait. The next generation. Um, mm -hmm. Tim, I, yeah, I wanted to ask you what, do you, what will Unreal Engine 5 mean for developers and creators as, you know, it comes to uh, full release and, and we get to see it? Well, it means a lot of things for a lot of different people. Um, you know, first of all, the team has put a lot of work into polishing the tools and the Unreal Editor um, to make it easier to use and more approachable and have more of the engine automatically work without having to go in and tweak settings. Um, so ease of use is a big part of it. Um, uh, massive scalability is another part that you can start uh, you know, with a small project and build something of, you know, grow it into in a project of any size. Uh, I think kind of the most magical part of the graphics pipeline now is the fact that lighting and geometry just work. You know, you don't have to worry about level of detail anymore. You just build your billion polygon mesh and making it run fast at every distance and every platform is the engine's problem, uh, which it solves really quite well. Um, and that you no longer have to, you know, fool around with placing all of these, you know, 
photographically unrealistically unrealistic lights in different locations to get the lighting look you want. Um, you can do exactly uh, what happens in the real world, uh, or you do exactly what a lighting designer would do on a movie set and place the lights you want, including area lights, and have your scene magically come to life uh, with all of the indirect illumination of, uh, of lumen. Uh, and the, the content libraries are, are another big part of it. You know, the fact that you don't have to build everything yourself. There's the Unreal Engine Marketplace and Quixel for a vast set of assets from uh, independent creators and from Epic um, and MediHuman technology for uh, creating an infinite number of humans, just being able to rely on a, a massive source of content at the highest levels of fidelity is uh, another another key part of it. And it's proven. Yeah, the other thing that hasn't gotten a, a whole lot of news coverage is that Unreal Engine 5 is powering uh, Fortnite Chapter 3. It's live now. Um, and have the biggest thing in a, in a team, the biggest obstacle to, to a team adopting a, a new version of the Unreal Engine is not wanting to uh, not wanting to try to use it before uh, Epic itself has released a game. And because we released a game now, you can you know count on every every feature uh, working to a, a really high degree of professional quality. Awesome, thank you. Well, speaking of you know what UE five is hopefully capable of and seeing what its uh, potential is, you know, here, let's show the, the teaser for The Matrix Awakens. Um, we released this brand new technical demo during the Game Awards um, on December 9th. And not only were we thrilled for all the impressive Unreal titles on display, uh, devs took Unreal devs took home nine awards, including Game of the Year. So shout out to the It Takes Two team. Uh, but it was an opportunity for you know us to showcase yeah what's coming and i don't know about you all but i was definitely on the edge of my seat uh during the show seeing all this content go live um so jeff as the technical director on the project will you kind of give an overview of it and like what our goals were when setting out to build uh the matrix awakens sure um for the record i was absolutely on the edge of my seat literally <laughs> trying to <laughs> when that countdown was approaching zero um but yeah when we uh when we set out like like the special projects team, you know, like Gail was was talking about, you know, we do a lot of um, a lot of internal projects to you know prove to ourselves that the engine is is capable and good, and and ready for prime time, and and we knew, you know, coming out of the Lumen in the Land of Nanite demo that we wanted to do something big. We wanted to take UE five, and and push it as far as possible and really show what the next generation could be or what we think the next generation can be. You know, what this what this generation of hardware can do. Um, so we knew we wanted to do something large. We wanted to do something open world. Um, we wanted to, uh, you know, move forward on tech like Nana and Lumen. We, uh, you know, we chose a city environment. Um, you know, to, we had a couple of rocks demos and we thought, oh, let's try something a little more, you know, a little more man-made. Um, let's put different stresses on those systems. And, um, and fairly early on, you know, we knew we had a, a, a partner in Warner Brothers and the Wachowskis, um, to use the Matrix IP. And so this idea of, you know, let's make a city um came about really really naturally um yeah so uh, another, another big push here was um coming out of uh Lumen in the land of nanite we um so we finished that right at the end of COVID, like literally the last day like you know we, we put the stamp on the bill and i left the office and haven't been back since like that was right when <laughs> that happened. um so we knew that we had we had been denied this opportunity to put that in people's hands. You know, we want to take the GDC and SIGGRAPH and, and those kind of things to show you that it's real, and and we, we couldn't do that. So we said, okay, you know, let's 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 go all the way with this one. Let's put this in consumers' hands, uh, and that really raises the bar in terms of development complexity and in terms of the robustness of the systems. Um, you know, we, we can't run it on a dev kit. You know, we have to have it in memory. Um, you know, we knew we wanted to target next gen. Uh, hardware, including the Series S, so that that put a lot of pressure on the team just to make sure that not only you know, is it sparkly and looks good on screen, but we can ship it in a real product. And that's what we did at the end of the day. Yeah, that's, it's awesome. I mean, you know, I know, Galen, you're talking about scaling up and, and Matrix Awakens did just that, right? We're talking 16 kilometers square. There's, I have, there's mm -hmm. crazy stats on it, like 7 million instanced <laughs> assets, 7,000 buildings, 40, over 45,000 cars, nearly mm -hmm. 30,000 lamp posts, like, it's incredible the amount of detail and just real life world you were able to put into this city. 
we really took this idea of scale to heart, like, you know, just early on. You know, we I talked about the, you know, we decided we want to do a big city. Um, you know, we did it 16 you know, square kilometers. And really, there was no artificial constraint on that. We, we just kind of inflated it and said, yeah, that's enough to prove what we want to prove. Um, you know, we, we could have gone bigger with that. And other teams, I'm sure, will go much, much bigger. Um, but we wanted to scale, you know, Lumen, I'm sorry, Nanite makes this, um, gives us incredible opportunity to scale in detail. Like, as you look across the city, it's equivalent detail all the way across. Like, the, you know, it's the same the same high fidelity at the very top of a building as it is, you know, at the, at the base level on the other side of the city. And as you fly around the city, you know, it's, it's, it's real and it's all real and it's all there. Um, uh, in terms of populating the city, we, you know, I talked about this a little bit before, but we built this, um, it's called mass AI, the system called mass AI, which is this really highly scalable AI system. And, uh, and that helped us achieve those super high numbers. Uh, you know, we built a, a traffic system and, you know, to make sure all the cars follow the, the stoplights and all that and the, the crowd uses the, the crosswalk properly and the crowd stays on the sidewalk properly um so so that i think was a huge accomplishment yeah that that team that team was awesome um honestly just building this content was a big challenge like we don't have a massive team uh, on special projects uh so we leaned a lot into uh, proceduralism we partnered with side effects and the, with the houdini tool to help us out with um with generating the city uh so we had a, a really nice pipeline that we could turn around really, really quickly, um, they actually regenerating the city and importing it was, I think, a couple minutes process. The, the biggest, the slowest part of the process was saving the file. Um, so I thought that, that was really cool. Um, and and we, we regenerated the city, I think, within a week of content lock. So so we were pushing that right up to the edge. Um, and and that, was, that, that enabled us to, to do this, right? We didn't have an art team to go in there and handcraft all this stuff. Um, and I think the, the results turned out wonderful there um and the last part of this is just the tools to author all this like you know i've got a beefy dev machine and i can't load that entire city and, and edit it um but the world uh you know the, the open world team and you know, with the world partition tools and the one top reactor tools for collaboration uh you know really stepped it up and and gave us the tools we needed to to make this you know to, to be able to, to load the parts of the city you want and move this trash can here and move this fire hydrant there and uh and, and those were, were super important in terms of scale, not just what's on the screen, but in terms of how you how you edit it and how you interact with it. That's, yeah, that's incredible. And so not and I think the most exciting part is, you know, we're getting to battle test these tools now, but eventually mm -hmm. it's something that other creators will will get to use and you can and leverage them to make their own large worlds and and interactive experiences and, and things like that. So um, yeah, yeah that, absolutely. Pass that along. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it was fun to get to use all these. You know, like a, a lot of what Unreal has been doing and pushing is this idea of empowering creators, like Tim mentioned earlier, and and getting to use the MetaHuman stuff, getting to use you know the Quixel content. Like they went and did some scans for us, and we used some of their off-the-shelf content. Um, Lumen, I mean, Lumen's amazing. Like in the city, when you're when you're driving around the city, um, there, there's one light in that scene, and it's the sun, the directional light. I, I think there's a skylight too, but it's not really like the real light. Um, and um but like the holy cow right that just works like you can be underneath an overpass completely and interact and it looks great yeah that's incredible um yeah I mean, my one of my favorite bits about the demo there is the um near the end one of our rendering programmers Dan right he uh he's like i wonder what it looks like when we turn off the sun so he just turned off the sun and it was amazing like he, he posted pictures and said we have to put this in the demo somewhere so that's i was like yes we have to put that in the demo somewhere that, that's super cool um so when you go into that night mode in the uh in the demo it, it's literally that entire scene's being lit by the emissives from the the lights and the car headlights and the windows like there's just no light in that scene and it looks great and um you know we didn't go in there and art direct it or anything special you know it, i'm sure we could tweak some settings and make it look even even better but uh the fact that it held up with just that sort of like it literally just works in every sense of the, the word so i thought that was super important. that's crazy mm -hmm. yeah um so, so again, you were talking about like learning resources and stuff. So um, I know we've announced this in a couple of different places, but we're, we're going to be releasing the city also uh, with UE5 when it comes out in the spring. Um, so all this content, all these vehicles, all these buildings, um, you know, the code and the blueprints we use to, to build it, uh, we're going to release as much of that as possible. So, you know, everybody can take it apart, can learn from it, can build their own stuff. Um, really excited to see what the community does with all this. Yeah, it'll be really really incredible and when you can go and download you can experience the um current demo on playstation 5 and xbox um 
And you can actually, after watching the inter or the more cinematic and interactive elements, you can wander the city and explore it mm -hmm. and toggle some of these features. So if you want to get into more of the like technical demo pieces of it, you can. Um, I know, yeah, you have the day and night cycles. What are some of the other um, instances yeah, that you can, can really turn check out? Yeah, you, you can. There's some um, some modes you can mess with the simulation sizes, so you can you can kind of turn on the visualization mode, so you can pull the camera way back and actually see um, the the mass AI stuff at work. You, you, know, you can see that it's not it's not just a bubble around the camera. Like we're actually simulating, you know, thirty five thousand pedestrians in the whole city. Um, you can um, th there's an Easter egg for the, the the night mode. There's the you can rotate the sun. Um, what am I missing? Oh, you can turn the matrix filter on and off if you want to see kind of a clean clean image, you know, get rid of the chromatic aberration and the film grain and stuff. To, we had that on to make it look filmic and matrixy, but, you know, if you want to see what the engine is producing, you know, raw, um, I think it looks pretty awesome in that mode. Um, there's a photo mode to play with, so you can fly around and, you know, get get in tight and on someone's uh, someone's eyeball and take portraits. And um, so, yeah, there's a lot of little toys. Also, Nanite view modes, you can, you can see um, a little bit of what Nanite's doing under the hood. All the triangles. <laughs> yes, all, all those triangles. Yeah, we were joking that there's going to be a, a world shortage of triangles earlier due to the Matrix <laughs> Awakens. So, bust out your pickaxes, pickaxes, and find some more for us. Uh, let's see. And then, yeah, um, well, yeah, it's just it's an incredible project. And congrats to you and all all the folks that worked on a project. It's it's really incredible. And um, yeah, we can't wait to be able to share some of those assets with the the community uh, next year. Um, any any additional points you want to make on the matrix before we head on? I just want to say thanks to the team. I mean, the, the, the team that worked on this was super amazing. Um, you know, our, our partners and, and collaborators, you know, Warner Brothers and, and Lana Wachowski and John Gaeta, um, were super great to work with. You know, we, we had some help from the coalition. They they were, you know, super professional and, and helped us a ton. Um, so I, the list is too long to name, but yeah, but everyone we collaborated with was was amazing. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and you can see the full, if you go to unrealengine.com slash wake up, you can actually see a couple of the articles we have. We give a shout out to a lot of the, the our partners that worked on it. And um, we've actually, what, released some lighting uh, presets in MetaHuman Creator if you want to make them look uh, like they're set in the Matrix world. So um, definitely check those out if you haven't yet. And the there's a roughly 10 minute video on our YouTube channel. If you haven't seen the experience yet and want to take a look at it, uh, we definitely encourage you to do so. All right. So kind of on the coattails of this with the Matrix Awakens and seeing that, um, you know, we're seeing the demand for real time production tools absolutely skyrocket, you know, over 30 recent major studio film and television projects are using UE to accelerate their production. We're talking projects Shang-Chi and The Legend of the Ten Rings, Dune, um, obviously The Matrix Resurrections, uh, Mandalorian, Ted Lasso. They've all used UE in some part of their pipeline, but whether it's from pre-viz or location scouting to in-camera VFX, um, you know, doesn't have to be the full production, but we're seeing these tools leveraged in significant ways. Um, I just want to give a shout out to some of the incredible studios behind these heavy hitting projects, Framestore, Digital Domain, DNAG, ILM, uh, Halon, Pixamondo, Weta. Um, we're always excited to see what these teams are doing and, and, you know, our partners help us make our tools better, right? We see their needs and what they're trying to accomplish and that forces and pushes us to um, improve our own tools and, and on their behalf. So. Um, with, in 2021, we released uh, 427, and that was a really big update for us to put the hands of these, um, or put these tools in the hands of creators everywhere, featuring, you know, loads of VP updates. Um, I'm sure you all leveraged a ton of them, but, uh, you know, easily, easy setup for in-display with 3D volumes, multi-GPU support, um, enhanced virtual camera systems for multi-user editing. And so that's a great way for remote teams to actually collaborate and work together. Um, and one of the things we did to really put these tools to the test, um, we partnered with the Filmmakers Collective Bullet and created our own short film, uh, shot entirely on Nant Studios LED stage in LA, California. So this is the 427 in-camera VFX test film. Um, Galen, you actually got to work on it, right? So uh, what was the process like, or what do you feel like some of the biggest boons to creators looking and in, getting into film and television creation can use these tools? Yeah, I mean, 
it's it's pretty awesome i mean the tech has come such a long way like uh, jeff and i both worked on the first virtual production demo that we did um you know i guess that would have been two or three i guess it was two years ago now yeah um yeah, it was but, uh, yeah. yeah yeah i guess <laughs> so weird <laughs> um but yeah i mean the tech has come such a long way like even just since we did that demo um and you know the stage at nant is so impressive i mean it's just a massive space um, and you can see it here in this video. It's just, it's crazy. Um, I think that, you know, for us, you know, in working on this demo, one of the things that we really want to do is obviously, you know, increase the visual fidelity of what we achieved, you know, from the previous demo. Um, and obviously GPU, Lightbaker, and, you know, Lightmess or Lightmess 2 and all these different things, you know, that we were showing, uh, you know, with this demo, I think ultimately it really came together at the end here, right? And obviously being able to kind of partner with Andrew Hamilton, you know, and his amazing scene in the Australia, demo that he put out. I mean, there's just so much amazing tech that kind of went into this, right? And again, you know, like we improved the tool set as a result of this demo, right? Like I think that's the thing that I keep coming back to with these types of projects is that, you know, we actually go through and use the tools and we say, all right, well, this isn't super intuitive. Like how can we make it better, right? And then we go back to the product owners and make it so that it is something that is a way more digestible experience like for, for actual creators. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, ultimately, I think that, again, this is just another project, you know, that just bringing so many talented people from Epic together to create something. I mean, it's 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 truly an honor, you know, to be able to work on these types of projects. And um, we have a lot more virtual production projects that we're working on behind the scenes. Um, and we're really excited to kind of show more of what we're doing and um, a lot more interactivity, a lot more kind of exciting things that we're seeing actually on sets, you know, like for, for productions that are shooting right now. Um, and trying to you know support those types of feature requests as well so lots more to come it's exciting and this and just to be clear like this whole thing was shot or at least produced in like four days right well so the uh i don't know exactly how long the, the shoot was like as far as like what we're seeing here what was captured mm, on this okay. part you know leading mm -hmm. up to it right like there was there was a lot of work as far as figuring out the environment specifically right. and you know obviously the tool set of getting 427 into a place like at least internally, where we could actually make it and functional and be able to shoot on on the day or on the week, rather that we wanted to actually produce the actual final result. Um, so I mean, there was a lot of work that kind of went into it on the front end for sure. Um, and honestly, you know, as you can see here, everyone is you know taking proper precautions, COVID wise, and everything <laughs> like that. There was so much logistically that the team had to figure out in order to kind of make that a safe environment as well. And so I don't want to understate that as well because. Again, like we were learning, you know, like everybody else is right now um, yeah. in the situation we find ourselves in. So, um, you know, for us to be able to sidestep and navigate through all these issues together as a team, I mean, it was just, it was a massive team lift to be able to get something like this off the ground. So massive shout out to the team in LA and everyone else that came out, you know, to be able to make this possible. So yeah. These are the type of projects that, that really excite me because so, so many different efforts over the years like come home and come together. You know, like uh, the the amount of different pieces, you know, just you see the rendering, but the stage control and the compositing and the collaborative tools and all this to be able to get some people on a stage and and realize their creative vision in a short period of time. Um, th th this is the stuff that really inspires me. And folks can like download this project, right? So the in-camera VFX uh, production test project is actually available on the marketplace. Um, and there's a complimentary tutorial series on the uh, our YouTube channel. Um, and as you mentioned, Andrew Hamilton's Australia assets, those are also available on the marketplace. So, you know, not only do you have these tools, you also have these assets and resources. And so we really hope that you'll dive in and, and make the most of these tools and share with us what you're making. Um, you know, in that, in the vein of virtual production and, and doing uh, test projects to push it, uh, we also, uh, the community also has access to the Slay animation sample project uh, that was created in conjunction with Mold3D Studios, um, a veteran uh, VFX or veteran art and VFX team. Slay was an exercise for them to explore virtual production workflows explicitly for animation. Uh, and if you missed it last week, they had joined us on Inside Unreal to discuss their workflow from uh, concept to final pixel. So it's just been really cool to see this evolution of, you know, here we do sample projects or test projects internally for us that then can turn into, you know, real tool changes and real world changes with our partners. And then, um, then we move on to like developing 
programs for uh, different teams. So, um, for example, we have the Unreal Fellowship, um, and this program is designed to help get uh, film and TV artists and agents and educators develop a strong command of virtual production. And so they go through 30 days of intensive training. And at this point, we've had over 450 students from 21 different countries uh, have gone now gone through the program. So, and these projects are absolutely stellar. Like they, they make something in a month and have oftentimes come totally fresh into Unreal Engine are making some really outstanding um, short films. Uh, so what you're seeing here is the Fellowship uh, 2021 Student Showcase. Um, you can see the complete films on Vimeo. Um, Galen, you helped support some of the, the Fellowship sessions, didn't you? Yeah, and I mean, I just like to underline that, that the diversity of, you know, the people that, you know, kind of came to like this event specifically, right? Because it's super impressive to be able to have, um, sorry about that. It's super impressive to be able to have, um, you know, such a wide group of people that come to this event, right? Because like, it's not just, you know, necessarily students, right, that are out of university, right? You even have people that are, you know, full on, you know, worked in the VFX industry for a long period of time and are actually looking to kind of level up their own skills. And I think that that's something that's really amazing, right? Is like people come in with a massive amount of experience, you know, and say, hey, you know, I've worked on, you know, 20 years of, you know, amazing high end visual effects films or whatever it is, right? And they're eager to learn and they're, they're really excited to sort of have this paradigm shift of working in real time, right? And I think that's one of the most exciting parts is being able to bring in was otherwise, you know, just the games industry, right? Like being able to diversify the talent pool into like all these different industries that, that we're able to be in, right? Um, it makes for just a really exciting conversation most of the time, right? Because I feel like at least I can say this for me personally and probably some of the other instructors, it's like, it's like, I feel like I learned a lot from the people that were there as well, right? And I think that's one of the coolest things about it, so. Oh, yeah. I think we're, you know, as more people use real-time tools, it's, you know, the game devs have a lot they can teach about the tools or about um, development and design to uh, film and television creators. You know, they can bring different perspectives or, you know, like, hey, here's storytelling techniques or that to game devs, They're, you know, uh, architects can bring designs and building structures to games that maybe they wouldn't have explored before. And so just this like knowledge share when you bring these different industries and these different, uh, these folks from different backgrounds together is amazing. And it's like, how do we, how do we keep pushing folks to <laughs> collaborate and share from all these different industries? Because I think that's so important to really bringing new and fresh and creative ideas uh, to the forefront of, um, you know, the development and, and whatnot. So, um, and on that note with storytelling, we had, uh, we excitedly got to partner with Tribeca to help push the boundaries of storytelling um, in film through virtual production programs, uh, or it was called Writing in Unreal. And um, if you haven't seen it, there are a number of sessions at tribecafilm.com slash unreal, uh, where we speak with industry experts on, um, this new pipeline for filmmaking and how to approach storytelling in real time experiences. So definitely encourage you to check that out. Um, they're really, really awesome. So I think it's just an exciting time for real time tools and uh, the transformation of all this. So, um, so speaking about sort of like cross collaborations, um, 2021 was featured a lot of incredible crossovers for our teams, even at Epic. So we had the innovative fashion house Balenciaga. Uh, they wowed the world with Afterworld, The Age of Tomorrow, a game to built to showcase their fall collection. Um, and then they took another major leap. They were the first high fashion label to drop in Fortnite with a set of digital outfits inspired by real life Balenciaga silhouettes. Um, which is just crazy, right? So it's like when we've been in games, we've been in film and television and architecture. Um, and now we're getting into fashion and that's crossing coming full circle back into Fortnite in the game world um so a lot of scan data and cad data models were absolutely vital to cre recreating like accurate digital versions of uh these outfits um beyond fashion or driving partnerships with automotive creators you know ferrari introduced its 296 GTB hybrid sports car in far Fortnite. <laughs> oh gosh, making history as the game's first highly realistic drivable vehicle. So, um, 
and we have walkthroughs of a lot of these things. So if you want to, if you go to unrealengine.com and look at these spotlights, you can see how a lot of these projects were made and put together. Uh, so definitely do. It's really fascinating technology. Um, and we were also excited to see the UE team um, and UE Unreal Engine content on display during Short Nightmares. We mentioned earlier uh, the Eye from Aaron Sims Creative featuring uh, Tethuzen, which is available for download on the marketplace. And We Will Be Monsters, a short film created by Animation and BFX House Plastic Wax. So there's just a lot of really, really fun and exciting um, collaborations across various industries. Um, Tim, I wanted to toss to you, what do you think all these collaborations um, mean for the future? What What is bringing all these together a uh, signal for our industries and real-time technology? Well, you know, right now it looks kind of like a variety show, right? There's all of these crazy things happening <laughs> in Unreal, from games to film, uh, to fashion, to automotive and architecture and everything else. But they're all part of a much larger trend, which is the metaverse. It's really starting to happen and we're seeing large parts of it coming together you know, now in real time, more and more of it every few weeks. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of hype around this. Uh, I was reading about the metaverse of, uh, of fruit because like some fruit company <laughs> wants to get into the metaverse, but there's a real trend here underneath it all, right? And that is between Fortnite and Roblox and Minecraft, there's one third of a billion users who are engaging in these um, you know, real-time 3D social entertainment experiences, which uh, you know, range from everything from games like Fortnite Battle Royale to Roblox experiences that uh, you really can't even call a game. It's more like just a way of hanging out with your friends and doing interesting stuff together. But um, what it's going to do is it's going to bring all of these separate businesses together um, on the foundation of real-time 3D assets. Um, and so the car, the digital car that Ferrari builds, uh, before they've started, before they've manufactured the first one, while they're still in the design phase and prototyping it, um, you know, will evolve throughout their development process and their marketing process. And then before it comes to, uh, you know, roads, it's going to come to uh, come to the metaverse. Um, and same for every film and television product that's based on, um, you know, real-time 3D production is a perfect opportunity uh, to, in parallel with the, the linear content they're building, um, to build awesome real-time experiences you can participate in. I think that's that's going to be really exciting and bring all these industries together in real-time 3D. And it's going to be an awesome opportunity for all game developers um, because you know we're seeing a new family of platforms emerge. Previously, you had to choose if you're going to build a game, are you building it for um, mobile platforms or console platforms or maybe PC? Um, now you have another major choice, which is to start building content for the metaverse. Um, and this is one of the major areas we're working on um, and, and kind of building out the entire foundation of uh, capabilities needed there, everything, everything from the tools to an economy um, so that game developers can earn a living in this space. Um, you know, that is hopefully uh, at some point in the near future more attractive than a living one could earn um, outside of uh, outside of the metaverse, trying to build an app for uh, for the traditional stores. And uh, it's kind of a uniting trend, right? It's going to bring all of these different industries together into a medium that's unlike anything that's existed previously. And I think we can hope it on it, hope for it being a, a much more positive experience than the things that we, we live with today in technology and social, you know, uh, you go to Facebook and you're seeing all kinds of controversy in politics because the algorithm curates uh, by engagement and negative content is engaging. Whereas when you're in Fortnite um, or you're in Roblox, you're generally hanging out with your friends, you're on voice chat or text chat, and you're having a good time with people you know, and you're encountering strangers, but it's always, you know, in a, in a distant way in which you, you're not constantly bombarded with all of the, all of the negatives of the real world out there. Um, so it can be incredibly positive. It can also transcend, you know, the pervasive advertising and annoyances that exist in the online world now, right? Instead of running an ad where you just have to watch some video for a period of time, drop your awesome new consumer product into the metaverse uh, as a drivable car. Um, it's not an advertisement, but it builds brand awareness and it's super fun. Um, and all of these crossovers are going to be 
I think building a, a much more interesting foundation for the future of uh, social than we've than we've had in the past. And so we're doing a lot along these lines, uh, a little bit more every month, and uh, we just wish we could do it faster. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, as part of that, you know, and, and empowering all kinds of uh, developers beyond even Unreal Engine developers, you know, Fortnite's a great way for us to bring features into gaming. And now we're sort of decoupling that and building services on it. So, you know, Epic Online Services has had a big year. Uh, Simon, what's happened since we last spoke and, and heard about EOS? Oh, uh a lot. Um, like, <laughs> you know, walking things. back, like, you know, we, we started building Epic Online services in, in 2019 uh, with the intent of, of making the cross-play capabilities we built for Fortnite available for all games, you know, empower all developers to achieve similar results. Um, so it's it's this whole set of free online services for game development. Any developer can use them uh, to ship their game across platforms, you know, with one set of services. Um, before diving in more, like um, Rajan um, made a made a great video summarizing what's available today. Um, if you could play that. Hi, my name is Rajan Kishna, and I'm a technical account manager here at Epic Games. Today, we're taking a look at Epic Online Services and how its free services can help you power your game with cross-platform functionality for authentication, multiplayer, voice chat, and much more. We built these services so you can add these features into your game without having to worry about infrastructure, cost, or building out these services yourself. Epic Online Services can roughly be divided into three sets of services. Game services to cover multiplayer, progression, and game operations. Epic Account Services, which provide Epic Account Identity, Friends, and Presence Management. And Store Services to manage Epic Game Store transactions. Game services can be used with any identity provider, for example, Discord, Google, Steam, and of course, Epic, while Epic account services and store services are linked to an Epic account. You can use as little or as many of these services as you'd like. And as mentioned, you can use game services without using Epic account services and vice versa. So if you'd like to use Epic online services peer-to-peer -peer networking with your own matchmaking solution, you certainly can. All right. So let's see, um, you know, and something, an important thing to keep in mind is that these services are totally free for any developer. So that includes folks developing on Unity, Lumberyard, Godot, any other engine. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, like for example, Fall Guys, you know, Unity game, been working closely with them. Um, you know, make sure the integration experience truly works on the engine. It's optimal for their workflows. Um, Part of that work included a plugin for Unity, which was developed with our partner Play Everywhere, um, released publicly just a couple of months ago. Um, similarly, for Unreal, we have an initial plugin for OSS, you know, for which much more is on the way as well. Um, all other engines, you know, the CSDK uh, is available. So we, we really focus on, you know, making making this work on all engines for all developers. It's all free. Um, and we as a, as a company, we, we truly believe in, in openness and, and democratizing the cross-play capabilities, you know, for all developers. Um, so this means free self-service and, you know, uh, free self-service services that you can integrate with basically any major account system and open ID provider. Um, some of these services also represent significant cost savings for developers. Um, for example, this, uh, just this summer, we launched cross-platform voice chat. Uh, for free. We also made easy and achieve available through Epic Online Services. Um, and, and this is rooted in a belief of, um, you know, for cross-play to succeed, you know, we as an industry, we, we need to be able to connect players with, you know, empathy, where voice chat is great. Uh, we need to keep our communities equal and fair across all platforms. Uh, so we also rolled out services like moderation, sanctions, um, on many of these type of services, for example, moderation and sanctions, we work closely with partners. Um, great example is Inner Slot with Among Us. Uh, they were just awesome partners to help us validate these services with a massive number of players. Um, and as we move closer to an open metaverse, um, for Epic, we, we strongly believe it needs to be a, a safe and an enjoyable space for everyone. 
you know, and, and also all ages. Uh, that's where Super Awesome also comes in with Kids Web Services, uh, which provides an online parental consent toolkit that aims to make it easy for developers and for parents to manage authentication and verification. Uh, this is available today as well uh, for free. You can sign up through the developer portal. Um, and with everything we do, we want to make sure we're inclusive to as many platforms as possible. Um, it's probably an incomplete list, but you know we cover PC, Mac, Linux, um, all console platforms. It's PlayStation, Xbox, Nintendo, um, as well as iOS, Android, um, Oculus. And recently, we also released support for Steam Deck, uh, specifically with Easy Enter Cheat. Um, and this is all in the spirit of, you know, by supporting as many platforms as possible, it gets us closer to achieving a goal of, you know, delivering an awesome player experience where there's no barriers to playing with friends. Um, you know, that really starts with the obvious, which is being built at the moment. Uh, but like, you know, we need to give players the ability to sign into any platform from any device, um, have a UI that's easy to connect to with friends, you know, easy to integrate for developers, consistent for players. Um, you know, so players can play with friends regardless of platform. Um, your, your ethos is really, your your friends should not be determined by the, the hardware or the platform they are on, but rather by the, the games they love, um, you know, the moments they want to share together, um, how you want to spend time. And we believe Epic Online Services could be, you know, could be very well one of the components that helps the industry unlock the next billion of players, you know, connecting friends, keeping them engaged, um, just better experiences. Yeah, absolutely love that. And uh, you mentioned, so you mentioned actually the open metaverse. Uh, what does open look like in the metaverse? Oof, great question. Um, I think we're just at the beginning of this. Um, it, it's really a long-term goal, right? Like as just as a few foundational principles, we want to get this right. Like, um, you know, openness and, and privacy are closely related in our minds. Like, you know, we, we want to see an open social infrastructure for games, right? And for Epic, it's not a data harvesting strategy. It's, it's not done with the purpose of gathering user and developer information. It's truly done with the purpose of building great software, building great service, services, uh, so other people can make their games better and contribute to this metaverse, contribute to these virtual worlds that are all connected. You know, we, we need an ecosystem that's, that's without gatekeepers. We need interoperability, we need data standards, um, we need governance frameworks, we need, you know, basically an infrastructure to connect an endless amount of virtual worlds, you know, send people on adventures that are never ending with friends, truly engaging, truly fun. Um, you know, developers and players need control of, of their data. Um, everything needs to be interconnected. It's, it's a lot to look forward to. It's a lot to build. I think it's, it's not necessarily a 2022 thing, but um, <laughs> we're, we're on a journey and we'll get there. We're on our own adventure marching that way. Uh, <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah so... I, I, even though we can't do it all at once, we're going to be making as many... Uh, threads of progress uh, towards this as we can. Um, and, you know, one of the things that happening in the next year, uh, we hope to do it this year, but uh, coming next year is opening up uh, the Unreal Editor tools um, and this new verse scripting language um, to the entire community to build Fortnite content. Um, you know, with the hope that uh, if our experiments work here, that uh, that could be a standards track uh, programming language foundation for the metaverse. Um, yeah, that we'd eventually launch as uh, as an open source uh, framework that other engines could adopt as well, as Roblox did with their uh, their their scripting language. Um, there's a lot to do there, but you know I think we need to make progress on all fronts rather than waiting for the ultimate standard to solve all of the problems at once. There's going to be a lot of work in the area of the economy, right? Because to have an open economy, it's actually quite complex, right? Fortnite. Uh, Spending occurs in the item shop when people buy cosmetics, but Fortnite players engage with the game because of all of these great Fortnite creative experiences people play. And so I mean, the economic foundation, when you move to an open metaverse in which there's revenue sharing between all of these different creators of, of value um, who are participating to this, together in this economy, um, they're going to need to be very technical standards for file formats and interoperability. Um, 
and they're going to need to be content and rating standards because metaverse needs to be a safe place and we need to before you go into a world you really want to know what's in there um, and whether you're going into a you know safe uh, space for any audience or a mature themed place or whatever um, and uh, you know th there's a lot of foundational work to do there to uh, to build all of this on a with the level of quality that you, you've come to expect from modern games Fantastic. Um, how do you feel, or what role does EOS specifically play in helping to build this this open metaverse? Simon? Oh, you know, the, one, one of the key parts of this is uh, players being able to talk to each other and, you know, be able to really easily connect with their friends. Um, and right now, you know, before EOS came along, everything was very siloed. You had Xbox Live, uh, locked the Xbox platform, PlayStation Network, locked the PlayStation platform, um, and Steam, and Nintendo had one. Um, you know, and our aim initially with Fortnite, uh, and then with the larger EOS initiative for all developers has been to connect players across all of these platforms. Um, and this isn't an effort to create another walled garden. Um, we want to interconnect our services, you know, our voice chat and our friends network with uh, every other platform partner who's willing. I think, you know, there's, there's a real opportunity for that. And everybody's recognizing that um, the power of connecting all of these separate audiences, uh, you know, if you find 100 million users here and 100 million users there, then pretty soon you put them together and you find you have a lot of users. Um, I think that's what we can do uh, you know, by having all of the ecosystem operators in the industry try to find ways to, to work together. And this is just one step. And it's kind of an example of the incremental nature of the metaverse. Voice chat across... Uh, Games and platforms isn't the metaverse, but it's a key component, um, you know, in establishing standards there to the future software stack that will power the metaverse. And there are dozens of those components, and we're going to build each of them in parallel, and they're going to come online at different times. And some will work, and some won't. And we're just kind of have to learn along the way and refine it. But the Epic Online Services Initiative is really an effort to transcend the platform boundaries. Um, and the, the ecosystem boundaries that currently exist there. And I'm really excited about that and proud of, uh, of what's being done there to kind of put the whole gaming world on a more solid uh, foundation. All right, thank you. So on, on talking about growth and uh, you know bringing more people into the ecosystem, we wanted to welcome uh, some various teams to the Epic family. We had a number of folks join us this year and we wanted to make sure to give them a shout out. So earlier this year, we had Rad Game Tools join us, um, bringing a suite of fantastic cross-platform data compression solutions. Um, help, you know, they help make games smaller, levels load faster, um, and Bank Video, uh, which is a performance-based uh, video codec. So these are both now built into UE as of 427. So make sure you're leveraging those tools. Um, we're really excited to have them join. Uh, and we certainly make use of their tools and hope you do too. Um, we've had game studios join us. So the Tonic Games Group for Fall Guys. And just recently, Harmonix joined us, which is an um, exciting opportunity, you know, makers of rock band and uh, various musical experiences. Um, also had Capturing Reality join us. They are the creators of Reality Capture, the state-of-the-art photogrammatic, photogrammatic software for 3D scans. Um, Galen, you've worked with uh, a lot of their tools, haven't you? Yeah, I mean, this is a this is a huge win for us, specifically with the inside the Quixel organization, right? Because, I, I mean, there's no secret, right, that you know, capturing reality is the industry standard as far as you know, actually processing photogrammetry data. And, you know, to have them part of the family now is just such a huge win for the team. Um, I mean, the fact that uh, we're able to like literally help influence, you know, pipeline and you know, the decisions that they're making, you know, sort of working together now collaboratively, uh, you know, as far as like, you know, hey, we're looking to do these different things, you know, as far as processing, um, how can we work together, you know, to sort of make a better product, you know, uh, I think that, again, it just really speaks to like, building sort of like this bigger bigger team right that is able to kind of collaborate and stress test the tools and do all these different things i mean that's massive for us so um so yeah definitely love having the capture and reality team uh here at epic uh, i think that 
we'll have some really, really exciting announcements uh, in the coming months. So stay tuned. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, we've also had Art Station join the family. Um, with you know hoping to bring expanded tools and resources and connections to the creative community um with that uh partnership uh, we've reduced art station marketplace fees and uh, they had announced when they joined us that their educational streaming platform art station learning would be free for the remainder of 2021 but they've just announced uh that art station learning will remain free so make sure to take advantage of that loads of great learning resources and tutorials there um we also had sketchfab join the team. Wonderful group of folks. Uh, definitely want to make their offerings more profitable for creators. So uh, they also reduce their store fees. And um, we're looking at ways to collaborate and be able to just show off all the incredible 3D content that's being made by creators around the world. So um, big shout out to those teams. We're super excited to have them part of the Epic family and continue growing and seeing what else we can build together. Um, Let's see, next, uh, we do want to give a shout out for the Epic Mega Grant. So we have a, a sizzle that was um, just released uh, earlier this week. And so, you know, Epic Mega Grants has always been about supporting developers and creators um, in a way that fosters innovation and success. And so we really want to make sure that we can lift up everyone um, we're really excited to share that we've supported more than 1,600 creators and teams across 89 countries. Um, so we've had nearly 400 new recipients benefiting from the program this year. And they are all kinds of projects, right? You're talking medical training simulation. We're talking um, really innovative game ideas, full feature films, small teams in uh, various parts of the world just doing incredible stuff. Um, all kinds of stuff. It's I just love seeing what our Epic Mega Rants recipients are capable of, and it's it's just an extension of you know the community and and what else they're um, they're building. And so, don't have a lot more to add to the Mega Rants unless anyone else would like to. All right, well we'll keep moving, but definitely go watch the full video and check out the the list that we just put out on our blog. Um, you can see more details about some of the most recent announcements um, for each of those projects, and they are definitely worth looking through. Um, we also wanted to give a shout out to our marketplace creators. So this year we continued to release free content. There's now over 700 free products on the marketplace, and we cannot thank our marketplace creators enough for the amazing content they continue to generate and that then empowers the broader community with. Um, we love giving uh, the monthly content away. Um, we also released a few special collections this year. Um, there was the Downtown West Modular Pack. We saw actual game assets from City of Brass and the Vagrant. Um, we mentioned earlier the Rural Australia set and um, uh, to Thusen created by Aaron Sims. Um, we also have Wind, Windwalker Echo. If you want to animate her and put her in your scenes, like she's on the Marketplace, the Slay Animation Sample Project, and the Marketplace has just continued to grow. So thank you all. It's up 40% in the last year, which is super exciting. Um, so we just love seeing that continued growth within the community. Um, and also kind of on that note, just a couple of days ago, a brand new Quixel Mega Skins pack appeared on the marketplace, which is part of a larger recent announcement. Galen. Yeah, I mean, this is this is huge for us. I mean, <laughs> trees are by far and away like the most requested asset type in the library that we've ever had. And this this goes back years. I mean, like literally for as long as I've been here and even before that, it's like when are trees going to be in the library? Um, Trees are one of the most complicated asset types by far, uh, as far as creating 3D content. Um, I mean, it takes so much work to actually get trees to actually look realistic, first of all, but also capturing them in such a way that is scientific based and, you know, uh, creating parametric growth patterns and all these different things that we're looking to do specifically like with trees is something that has finally culminated in this is a release that we put out yesterday. So. Um, they're on the marketplace. They're free for Unreal Engine users. Uh, it's a small pack. It's just the European Black Alder pack. So um, yeah, I think we have around 20 different models right there, um, but they're ready to use. You can start dropping them into your projects today. 
Um, and the thing that's so cool about them in my mind, honestly, is just that they come with so much control, right? So if you go in and start, well, actually we have a whole, whole breakdown video, so I won't get too into the weeds of that, but like there's so much control that you can have, you know, as far as like changing uh, the seasons of the tree. So like the health of the actual trees, you know, the, the leaves themselves and the colors, all these different things. Um, so the team has worked incredibly hard. So massive shout out to the apex team internally, uh, to be able to bring this to the community. Uh, we cannot wait to see what people do with it. So, yeah. So we dropped a link to that in chat. If you haven't played with them, go try it out and definitely give us your feedback. You know, um, they are in early access. So this is meant to be experimented with, played with and, and a time for iteration. So do let us know how you, will, uh, find those tools working for you. Um, those are our really major beats for 2021. Um, anything you would like to comment on or look, what should folks look forward to the most in 2022 and in the future? Well, Unreal Engine 5 launching is gonna be a big thing <laughs> uh, with the official release and going into the regular uh, update cycle. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we launched Fortnite on Unreal Engine 5, uh, Fortnite Chapter 3, with the aim of getting it working and getting it out, as opposed to taking advantage of radical new features uh, at scale. And so it's going to be quite a lot uh, of interesting technology to experiment with um, in, the, in the land of Fortnite development there that the team will, uh, will have to grapple with. Um, the other thing is... Uh, these uh, tools we've been working on, the Unreal Editor for Fortnite and Verse, which we'd hope to ship this year. The team has been working so hard on that. It's just amazing, amazing effort. Uh, but what we don't have is a ready version of it. And so that's going to be coming next year. Um, and uh, a lot of exciting uh, things will come out of that. Um, and then there are many, uh, many other interesting and exciting things that will happen uh, that we can't even talk about yet. So uh, it's, it's going to be another great year and a, a really exciting one for the world of 3D. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, thank you all for joining in today. I know we're getting to the end of the year, but it's always, it's always really nice to look back and see just how far we've come in a year. And um, I know when <laughs> pulling up the run of the show, it's like, wait, that happened yet? That happened this year? wait, are you sure? And so time is um, weird. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it really is. But we really appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Thank you to the community um, for joining us for being along on this journey with us and making all kinds of incredible projects. Um, it has been absolutely a pleasure to see your games, your short films, um, your visualizations, everything you've been working on we cannot like state enough how much we're always sharing projects internally and just being like oh my gosh did you see what this person did or that person did please keep it up you are constantly in a source of inspiration for our teams and it's why we do what we do so with that we want to leave you and wish you a wonderful holiday a happy new year and we will see you next january thank you all so much for joining us so Thanks, all the everybody. best everyone <laughs>